Family mode. Thank you everyone for joining us for another Learning Lunch hosted by EMR Approved and FormedTraining.com. My name is Brian Johnson. I'm the Senior Director of Online Training and Education with EMR Approved and I'll be your moderator today. Today's Learning Lunch is five things you need to know to comply with the new HIPAA omnibus rules. It will be presented by Mr. Mike Semmel. Mike is lead contributor to the new EMR approved weekly column on HIT security and is a professional security consultant with his own firm, Semmel Consulting. If you have questions during the session, please enter them into the chat area during the presentation. Answers to all questions will be posted to Mike's column on our website in the coming week. Also, as we are often asked this question, Please note that all registered attendees of today's session will receive an email later in the day with links to both the recorded and PDF versions of our session today. Mike, today's presentation is on the topic of compliance with the new HIPAA Omnibus Final Rule. Before we get into that, can you give those in attendance today who might not be familiar with HIPAA a quick summary and background on the law? Thanks, Brian. Uh, first of all, Thanks, everyone, for joining today, and uh, good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast, and good morning to the rest of the country. Uh, I think HIPAA history uh, is important because there are a lot of organizations that uh, may not have been up to date with the original HIPAA rules, and now that the final rule for the omnibus uh, is out, or the final omnibus rule is out, we're going to have to go through and make some modifications. So I want to create a baseline here. So HIPAA stands for the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, and it goes all the way back to 1996. And the health insurance portability concept was that it allowed employees to switch jobs without being denied by the new employer's insurance. And that used to be a challenge back before HIPAA, that if you were looking for a job and you decided you wanted to move from your company, that you had to make sure that the new employer's health care would take you and HIPAA was originally designed to make that easy because if you were covered by insurance in one job, uh, with, with several exceptions, you could be, uh, you, would, you would have to be accepted by the insurance at the new job. HIPAA also simplified billing codes and processes. So hospitals and doctor's offices, medical practices that were billing insurance companies used to have different codes for each company and it was very complicated and one thing that HIPAA did was simplify the billing code processes. The main thing that it did is it changed the privacy of the data. So it laid the groundwork for shifting the ownership of patient data to patient. And that sounds logical because HIPAA has been in place for a long time now, and I think we're all used to this, but HIPAA made history at that point by really making it clear that the patients owned the data. And then it also laid the groundwork for securing patient data from unauthorized disclosure. And we were at a point where some patient records were being moved to electronic. Back in 1996, there were not a lot of electronic medical records or uh, practice management programs, but the handwriting was on the wall, and HIPAA was very uh, forthright in coming through with security rules that hopefully were vague enough that they would sustain, they'd be sustainable as technology changed. All right, if we can go to the next slide, thanks. So there are buzzwords in HIPAA, and the first one is PHI. Actually, the first one's HIPAA, the second one's PHI. So PHI is protected health information. That is any information at all. So it is the verbal words that are said in a doctor's office. It's the written word that would be on charts and in reports and things, and it's electronic. PHI has to be identifiable. So seeing a treatment plan or a diagnosis without a patient's name, it's not identifiable. Seeing a patient's name simply on a piece of paper without having any treatment information or diagnosis information, well, with again, with a few exceptions, is not going to be considered PHI. EPHI is electronic data. And when we talk about electronic data, 
most organizations, many medical offices, think that all of it's residing in the electronic medical record system, and it's not. The electronic data goes back to many practices before the EMR systems were adopted, and there are also reports. I was the CIO in a hospital, and we used to export a lot of data for our department managers who needed to do reports and file information with cancer registries and the state and different regulatory bodies. So we're exporting data from the EMR system, and it was being stored on our servers, and it was not within the EMR system. There are letters that organizations have typed over the years. Remember that we have retention rules in healthcare, so we can't just go limit all of this without violating other laws. So this information has to be stored, but what kept me up at night as the CIO for a hospital was not the data in the electronic medical record system because that was contained, it was easy to manage. It was all the unstructured data that we found out was around the organization. We had people sending emails, uh, text messages, which is totally inappropriate for medical data, audio files. When doctors were recording their case notes for transcriptionists, those files were then turned into electronic records and sent to the transcriptionists. So even the audio files that we had were protected. We had medical device data coming out of our radiology department and other specialty departments from spirometers and MRIs and things like that, which when you first look at them, you don't think of them as computer input devices, but they are. We're used to mice and keyboards as computer input devices but most of these medical devices now talk to a computer someplace and that data is also protected. So one of the problems that we have is that the unstructured data is often hit. So HIPAA is broken down in tools. And what we're going to focus on for this discussion today, because it, the discussion is really about the omnibus rule, but I want to go back and talk about the privacy rule and the security rule briefly because those are the things that modified with the new regulations. So the privacy rule goes back to 2003 is when it was implemented. It protects written, verbal, and electronic data. Patients own the data. Patients can release the data. And for medical practices, you had to do a lot of things. One of them was you had to send out a notice of privacy practices. Now, we're not going to get into great detail on these rules because what we really want to talk about today are the changes. So with the security rule, which came into effect in April of 2005, that protects electronic data. And it's a whole security framework. And that includes administrative security. And administrative is policies, procedures, documentation, and user training. And then we have physical controls, which literally are locks on doors and the physical protection against equipment being lost or inappropriately accessed by unauthorized people. And then we have the technical safeguards. And when we talk about protecting electronic data, a lot of people think the technical safeguards are what most of the security rules about, but that's not the case. Technical safeguards are kind of a small portion of it because the administrative rules in the HIPAA security rule are over 50% of the rules that have to be followed. And that's important to understand because you can't just protect the computer or protect the server or protect the network using tools. You have to educate the IT people so they understand, for instance, what electronic protected health information is, how to recognize it, how to manage the access to and then track who's getting the access. And then HIPAA has a concept of minimal necessary. So that means that for your job, for your role in the organization, you should only have access to the protected information that you need to do your job. So in some organizations, in larger organizations, for instance, a receptionist may not have access to lab reports because in a large organization, they don't deal with those things. There are other people within the practice or within the hospital that deal with lab reports. Small practice, the receptionist may have access to the lab reports because part of their job is to make sure labs come back or labs have come back 
before the patient visit. So it varies, and that's one thing about HIPAA, that both these privacy, the privacy rule and the security rule are both very flexible because they have to apply both to very small practices, the quote-unquote country doctor, which is uh, one employee or one practitioner, a doctor, and perhaps a nurse who is also a receptionist in a small office. So it applies to that organization. It also applies to the largest healthcare organizations that we're all familiar with that may own hundreds of facilities and have many thousands of patients or thousands of employees and thousands of patients. So more buzzwords that we have within HIPAA, covered entities and business associates. So a covered entity is a healthcare provider, a payer, and a clearinghouse. And essentially HIPAA follows the money trail in medicine. And those are the organizations that are considered covered entities and have to have had to have compliance programs going back to 2003. Covered entities can share information with each other for patient treatment and the payment of uh, the services and also operations. And covered entities, since the beginning of HIPAA or the beginning of the privacy rule going back to 2003, have been directly liable to the government for data breaches. HIPAA also identified business associates, BAs. And BAs support companies and have access to patient data in the course of their work. So some of the examples would be the electronic medical records organization, the, the company that you bought your software from or your system from, will have access to your data perhaps when they're setting up your system, when they're troubleshooting your system. If you have a help desk service from them and you log in and they say, we'd like to open a session with you so that we can see what you're seeing on your screen, they're going to have access to the patient data. There are a lot of organizations that have access to patient data. We'll talk about more of them later in the program. But business associates are not allowed to share information unless the specific reason to do it and the covered entity is authorizing that. So the associate relationship has been governed by a document called the Business Associate Agreement, BAA. And the Business Associate Agreement is a, an agreement that up until now has simply been between the covered entity and the business associate limiting what the business associate is able to do with authorizing them to get to it. So until now, business associates have not been liable to the government for data breaches. Essentially, their responsibility was back to the covered entity that they were working with. So if there was a data breach by a business associate, the business associate would report the data breach back to the covered entity. The covered entity would have to report it to the affected patients and also to the government and the covered entity was the organization that was investigated and penalized. The government reach out and get to the business associate. Because the business associate agreement was a contract between the two parties, the covered entity did have the right to sue the business associate for breach of track, but the government could not reach out and get to the business associate. HIPAA enforcement was fairly lax back in the early days of HIPAA because there was only one civil and one criminal enforcement entity. You had the Department of Health and Human Services that could enforce the civil penalties and the U.S. Justice Department that could enforce the criminal penalties of HIPAA. So there was a lack of resources, both financial and personnel. There were few penalties. From 2005 when the security rule kicked in, or actually 2003 when the privacy rule kicked in, uh, for a period of five years, there were very few penalties considering the number of covered entities and business associates that were out there. And the fact was that some practices and organizations ignored HIPAA, and it was unlikely to result in a bad result. Uh, that there were not too many people that were paying attention to this, and if breaches occurred, uh, sometimes they went unreported. Uh, 
And even if they were reported, again, the government didn't have the resource to go after everyone. So my experience in talking to practices is that even though many abided by the privacy rule in 2003, because frankly, it was pretty easy. There were some changes that had to be made to reception areas. There were uh, documentation changes, and you had to put in administrative help to deal with patient uh, patients' requests to release their information and things. But the security rule that kicked 2005 was a lot more complicated, and it was tied to the technology. And if you didn't have a full-time IT staff, it was pretty difficult to implement. And again, my experience is that many practices ignored the security rule. And the other thing that I find out a lot by talking both with business associates or organizations that when we explain what a business associate is, they say we do those things. They'll tell us that they don't have uh, signed business associate agreements with their healthcare clients. And when we talk to some of the healthcare clients and ask about their business associate agreements, some of them don't even know what it is. So the reason for going through some of this history is to set these uh, standards that when we get to the changes, you'll understand what they are. But it's also important to know what was required back in 2003 for the privacy rule and 2005 for the security rule. In 2009, there was a law passed called the High Tech Act. And it was part of this bill that uh, had a lot of different funding aspects to it. It was not part of health care reform, which has been known as Obamacare. So the High Tech Act funded $36 billion for the electronic medical records implementation. They actually call it EHR, the Electronic Health Records Incentive Program. And a lot of you are familiar with the term meaningful use. So meaningful use and the electronic health records incentive program goes back to the High Tech Act part of the stimulus package. One other thing that it did was that it funded HIPAA enforcement. It also authorized attorneys general to enforce HIPAA civil penalties. So essentially overnight we went from one city that could enforce HIPAA to 51 across the United States. The High Tech Act changed the data breach law and made it reportable for an event, that, uh, an incident that lost 500 patient records a state had to be reported within 60 days. If it was fewer than 500 records, there's an annual report that has to be submitted that shows those. It also included a term which we're going to talk about more as we go through this program, that said that a data breach really was only a situation, uh, a reportable situation, if it created harm or the risk of harm the individuals whose data was breached. I think the most significant part of the High Tech Act is that it required business associates to comply with HIPAA the same as covered entities. And we'll talk more about that as we go on. So I'd said that HIPAA had not been enforced much from 2003 when the privacy rule kicked in up through the time that the Tech Act came into being. And last year in 2012, several things happened. Uh, first, early in the year, a five-doctor practice in Arizona was fined $100,000 for sending patient records through an online email service and also posting appointments, which included identifiable information, obviously uh, patient names and treatments or diagnosis, to an online calendar. And that surprised a lot of organizations that made Forbes magazine because people didn't think that a five-doctor practice was large enough for the enforcement people at HIPAA to care about. Obviously, they did. Later in the year, a doctor from a hospital in Massachusetts was traveling in uh, Korea and had a laptop. And actually, these things happened earlier, uh, but the enforcements came in 2012. The hospital was fined one and a half million dollars because a laptop with unencrypted patient information had been lost. Later in the summer, 
the old health department from the state of Alaska was fined $1.7 million because a tech lost a hard drive that contained patient records. And right at the end of the year, a small hospice in North Idaho was fined $50,000 for a laptop. And in an interview, the head of the Office for Civil Rights, which enforces the HIPAA regulations, said that they're actively investigating other breaches and that there will be more announcements to come. One other thing when we're talking about HIPAA is that we can't ignore other regulations. GBA, the Graham Leach Liley Act, is a federal law that protects personal financial information. And some healthcare organizations collect personal financial information for different reasons, and they also have to comply with LBA. Forty-six of the states here in the United States have data breach laws. And you can't be in a state that has a data breach law and only comply with HIPAA and think that you're done. There may be things in your state laws that you have to pay attention to. One of them, we mentioned that the data breach laws give 60 days to report the loss of over 500 patient records. That's the federal level, but in California there's a law that reduced that to five days. So it's very important to understand what rules apply to you. The state of Massachusetts has a privacy law that doesn't just govern businesses that in Massachusetts. They say that if you have data, financial data, protected data about Massachusetts residents, that you have to comply even if your business isn't located in Massachusetts. And they have a lot of requirements in that law. PCI DSS is a requirement from the payment card industry. So it's not a law. It's not passed by a government. But it's how the credit card industry monitors itself probably because they don't want government intervention. And they require a lot of security things to be done depending on how many credit card transaction process. And the downside would be that if you don't abide by the regulations, you lose the ability to take credit cards, which could kill many businesses. The statistic is that, that's generally accepted is that over 70% of regulated organizations have to comply with multiple rules. So one of the messages today is, even though we're talking about HIPAA and the HIPAA omnibus regulations, you should all take a few minutes to find out if you need to comply with other regulations based on the type of that you store or where your locations are, where your facilities are located. So, Mike, what would you say are the most significant changes to HIPAA that were recently announced in the new omnibus rule? I think the biggest change, and, and we're going to talk about it in more detail, is the rural business associates. There are things that practices have to do and healthcare organizations have to do, but they now have to spend a lot of time. The covered entities have to work hard to deal with the requirements for their business associates. And the flip side is, is that the associates have to work pretty hard to create their own compliance programs and also make sure that their subcontractors, organizations that they work with, are also compliant. So we have the way that the, the government worked. We had an interim rule, and now we have the final rule. So the interim rule goes back to 2009. And what the government does is that it publishes these rules for comment. And different organizations, anybody, can look at this. It's, it's a public document and ask questions, make suggestions. Several things happened. The new data breach rule went into effect at that time, but some of the business associate and other compliance requirements didn't. The statement had been out there since the Tech Act that a business associate needed to comply, but until the rules were written, there was really no to understand exactly what was going to be required. The final omnibus rule surprised us a bit because it's been sitting with the uh, Office of Management and Budget since last March, and normally it would take uh, just a month or two to, to be sent back to the department, in this case, Health and Human Services Department. But it sat there for a long time. 
and then uh, I think it was January 17th was released and it was published in the federal record in its effect March 26th of 2013. So when we're talking about complying now, essentially some of these rules, the beginning of the compliance period starts March 26th and business associates have been given 180 days from March 26th to complete, which means that the deadline is going to be in September of this year. How about notices of privacy practices? Are all covered entities required to send new MPPs to all their patients, Mike? No, but before I get to that, there were a couple of other changes to the privacy rule. In the past, the patients have been able to get their information on paper. Now they're allowed to request it in electronic format. Uh, there's been some discussion about that. One of the issues by giving somebody something in electronic format is that if a patient walked into your office with a thumb drive and asked you to move the data over to that, uh, that thumb drive could contain a virus. It could create problems on your network. So the healthcare organizations have objected to that. Uh, the HIPAA enforcing people or the people that write the rules have basically said, you can come up with a way to do it as long as it, you're not really profiting from it. You can provide the information in a different format than, than having the patient come in and, and if you to put something into your computer system um, and, and may cause problems. Moving the, the rule to say that the patients may request records on the electronic format is simply recognition of the fact that so many electronic health records and electronic medical record systems are being implemented. Another change was that patients must specifically authorize marketing communications paid for by a third party. That used to be an opt-out where it was assumed that you were approving it unless you said no. Now it has to be specifically approved. And the reason two things are important to understand is that these are now things that have to be changed in the Notice of Privacy Practices. So Brian, you don't have to send out NPPs to all patients. That would be very uh, burdensome for the healthcare industry, very costly, but when the new rules are kicked in, you do have to give the new notice of privacy practices recognizing these changes to your new patients. You also have to make them easily available to all patients. And I think the example that was in the 562-page document that uh, was released on January 17th and I read over the following weekend said that an example would be that in a doctor's waiting room you would post the new NPP on the wall and have a small um, holder below that where the patients could pick them up. So what we're trying to say is they don't want to create a lot of burdens where people have to ask for these things. The practices need to make them available easily to the patients. But to answer your question, no. New uh, notices do not have to be sent out to all existing patients. All right, before we uh, dig in on the business associates changes, what other changes were made to the rules? Well, one of them was pretty big because it changed between the interim rule and the final rule, and that doesn't usually happen. So the interim rule that was published back in 2009 said that a data breach was only reportable if it created a significant risk of harm to the individuals that were affected. And when the final rule came out, it took harm requirements out. And that's caused a lot of controversy because if a doc laptop, for instance, is lost, and this happens a lot, there are a lot of studies that talk about 100 laptops being lost through airport security every day. And uh, we know that laptops are stolen out of cars and offices, and, and many of us, including me, have been the victim of that. So in the past, an organization could determine that for itself, essentially, that there was no harm that could be done to the patient. Uh, it was unlikely that the information would be accessed. Uh, whatever the, the reasons were, if they could say that there was no harm, they were claiming that it, that it didn't have to be reported. And this was an important concept with the new breach law. This changed, and they removed the harm requirement. So now a data breach 
is assumed unless it can be proven otherwise. That's huge change. So an organization, let, let's continue with the laptop example, can do a risk assessment that may show a low probability of release. So if laptop was lost and came back within an hour, someone found it or returned it or um, it was being held in an airport and, and the security people went and got it for you, that laptop is supposed to be inspected and they use the term forensic, using a forensic inspection to make sure that no one accessed the data. So if there's proof through a forensic examination that no one accessed the data, then that can be considered a non-breach. The other considerations are what was lost, what type of data, did it include things like financial data as well as healthcare data, who accessed it, did a workforce member, somebody that worked for you but wasn't authorized to see the data, or another covered entity. So the example that was used in this uh, discussion was that if a doctor's office faxes a report to a different doctor's office and they get a call back saying, we just got this report on your patient, we don't think it should have been sent to us, and you said, yeah, it was sent by mistake. If that doctor immediately destroys it, that's considered a non-breach. And one of the questions that keeps coming up is, why isn't every loss of data, even a simple mistake like I just described, considered a data breach? And the reason for it is, is that the, the statement made by the Department of Health and Human Services was that they don't want to have the patients inundated with so many breach notification and have the industry overreact by notifying patients to the point where the patients, I'd use the term, become numb to these and don't even recognize when a real breach occurred. There's also a cost consideration to the healthcare industry. So these questions that are asked during the risk assessment, if they show a real low probability of release, which you have to document and make available for inspection by the government, if you do the risk assessment, you believe there's a low probability of release, then you can say it's not a breach. Otherwise, any inappropriate or impermissible use disclosure of PHI is a breach and you no longer can apply the harm question to this. All right, let's talk about business associates. I think that's why a lot of people are on this call. First of all, business associates are now required to implement full compliance programs. And when I say a full compliance program, that means go back to the original HIPAA regulations and creating the policies and procedures within your organization, training your workforce, and maintain documentation over time, actually following proper business practices that comply with HIPAA and making sure that you have documentation that if you're ever audited or if there's a breach investigation, that you can prove that what you did was correct. One of the big things that the rule focused on is subcontractors of business associates. So now there's a chain that's very clear which goes from the business, I'm sorry, goes from the covered entity to the business associate but now trickles down the line to other companies and people that the business associates work with. And there were some things that were discussed clearly in the commentary around this rule that you're a business associate by act, not contract. And I, I actually capitalize those letters for this slide uh, because even if a contract does not exist, let's say you're providing services to a healthcare organization and they don't ask you to sign a business associate agreement, that's something that they should have done, but it doesn't mean that you're off the hook. Now that you are going to be liable to the federal government directly, we'll talk about that, that you have to be able to do all these things, or you have to do all these things, even though you may not have a contract in place that says you're a business associate. So th there was a lot of commentary on this, and the biggest news with business associates is that now you are liable directly for penalties. So if your employee breaches patient data, 
you still have to report it back to the covered entity. The covered entity still has to report it based on the data breach requirements. However, after the investigation, if you're found to be at fault, your organization can be penalized directly by the federal government. One thing to note is that doesn't shift the liability from the covered entity. The covered entity invited you to the party. The covered entity asked you to provide them with a service where they shared patient data. And keep in mind, it's not their patient data. They're a caretaker of the data for the patients. So covered entity can also be found liable for your breach. There's some specific terminology about the relationship that a business associate would have with a covered entity. And if it's an agent relationship where the covered entity is working on behalf of the, I'm sorry, the business associate is working on behalf of the covered entity to provide certain services as an agent, then the covered entity has more liability. But if you're a business associate providing just support services, even though there may be less liability for a covered entity, it still exists. So covered entities now have to work with their business associates, and the business associates have to work with the subcontractors to make sure that the whole compliance chain is intact. One example that we use would be a data center, and I'm going to talk about that in, in a, just a second about some new things that affect data centers, but an IT company may be providing, for instance, backup services to a healthcare organization. They may have a system in place that takes the data that the health organization creates and sends that through an online system through the internet securely uh, in an encrypted format to a data center for storage. So when you don't really think about it, if you're the healthcare organization, when the business associate offers you this service, that they may not own the equipment and they may, re they may be reselling another company's services. That's the concept of a subcontractor. Subcontractor could also be an individual who provides certain services, maybe programming services or something like that, for a business associate, but they're not themselves part of that business associate's workforce. So this is the concept of subcontracting, and there was a lot of discussion about that. This is a huge change for covered entities and business associates now to go to that next level and make sure that the subcontractors are also compliant. One big thing that changed was adding a word to the new rule that changed a lot of things for data centers and even paper storage companies. In the past, HIPAA has defined two different types of services. One would be a conduit. So a conduit would be the U.S. Postal Service or FedEx or UPS. It would also be an Internet provider. So it could be Verizon or AT&T or one of the cable companies that is simply transmitting data that line. Those are called conduits because they move data. They don't store data. What HIPAA did was, I'm sorry, the new omnibus rule did, is it now says that those organizations are pretty much the same as they always were, but any organization that maintains data is now a business associate, even if they don't access the data. So some of the paper storage companies said that they were not business associates because they only received sealed containers and they never opened them, so therefore they were like a, con a conduit. They weren't different than the postal service moving a sealed envelope from one place to another because I never looked in there. The new rule changes that. It says that if you maintain data, that you're now a business associate. There's been some discussion about the term access, the word access that's also included in the rule. But if you read the entire rule, you can really see that I think the government's made a statement that they are not uh, interested or capable of going into every situation to determine whether certain encryption is used or if your business policies or procedures would exempt you. And from the original rule back in 2009 till this rule and now with the publication of this rule, they did not put qualifiers in. So 
data centers that have racks full of servers, and in many cases, they're not their own servers. They rent out rack space, and the racks are locked and only accessible by the people that own those devices. According to the new rule, they are maintaining the data, and they're now business associates. Online backup providers. So you hear ads for them on the radio, but there are business class solutions where that are resold through IT specialists and other companies. So again, you may not even be clear who's providing the service to you as it moves down the line. Those online backup providers are maintaining data. In this case, it's backed up data. The term cloud has been used for the last few years in the IT industry. It's, a, it's kind of a buzzword for IT, but it's a service del delivered across the internet. Many of those services store data. And many of those organizations have no control over who's accessing them, what they're doing, what type of data they're putting up there, and they're objecting to the idea that they should be business associates. But again, I'll say that the rule is clear in the sense that it doesn't exempt them. There's a question of whether or not they have access, but I think with a clock running right now down till September for compliance, the longer people argue and try to wiggle out of this, the harder it's going to be for them to comply and the more risk they're going to have in September if they've tried to argue that they're not a business associate, they get down to the deadline, and then there's a data breach and they're investigated and they're found to have caused it, and that may be considered willful neglect. One of the last types of services listed here is hosted email and mail archiving. So hosted email is where you have a computer on your desk, and instead of having a server in your office, there's a, a system, a server available through the internet or through a hosting service, which is not in your office, that has your data on it. And then mail archiving is a system where when an email is sent or received from your organization, it's actually copied into an archive where it can't be removed. Some organizations do this for business reasons, others do it for compliance reasons, but those organizations also may have protected health information. So the key thing is that a business associate is now an organization that maintains data even though they don't access it. It's controversial, but I really think that the government has stated with this rule that if they're going to make a mistake, they'd rather penalize organizations and create costs for these organizations rather than risk having data released. And it's a recognition of the fact that in the old days, if you wanted to steal a thousand patient records, you needed a pickup truck and four strong guys to go to a doctor's office and carry charts out to the truck. Now, to steal a thousand patient records, it can be done in seconds by somebody sitting halfway across the world. So these are the reasons I, behind these rules, but they're big. Mike, let's just take a step back for a second. And I want to ask, why are business associates being singled out now? Have, have there been problems with breaches? Yeah, Brian, it's a great question because business associates uh, are frustrated, and I think some are in denial even. Uh, about these new rules, but yeah, it, it's been for specific reasons. Uh, if you go out to the database that's online for data breaches, about 20% of them have been caused by business associates. And the government until now has not had any reach to penalize them, and there's been no requirement that they put in compliance uh, programs even though they're handling the data. Uh, recently, uh, just before the end of the year in November, there was a company that provides uh, pharmacy, like a, a pharmacy cart that dispenses medication. And there was uh, a problem, as I understand it, with some software. So an employee gathered data from three different healthcare organizations onto a laptop, and the laptop was stolen, and that was a breach of 68,000 patient records. And I think the important thing to understand is that there's nothing the government can do except go to the three healthcare organizations that contracted with this company and penalize them. So it really doesn't necessarily fit the crime. The, the enforcement doesn't fit the crime. But these things do happen. They happen all the time. 
and frankly these are the ones that we know about and there may be others that haven't been reported but I think you know it's a good example that when 68,000 patient records are breached by a business associate that it's logical that requirements be placed on the business associates. All right, let's talk about the things our attendees can do to comply with the new omnibus rule. Okay, so I think the first part of compliance is to look at where you are now. That covered entities, as I said, in, in some cases had worked very hard to comply and in other cases hadn't. So first thing you need to identify is, do you have the baseline to start with, or where is that baseline? And if you have not had a strong compliance program going back to the privacy rule in 2003 and the security rule in 2005, you've got a lot of work to do as opposed to an organization that has had a good compliance program and stays up to, with it and just needs to make these modifications. So. One of the things that we found uh, at the end of 2012 when we were doing meaningful use security risk analysis for medical practices is that some of those medical practices didn't even know what a risk analysis was. And it was a trigger because it told us that they had not complied with the security rule because the HIPAA security rule going back to 2005 required a, a risk analysis. It was literally the first item on the list. So that's one of the things that we have seen. So if you're an organization that really doesn't have uh, a good HIPAA security program, which would be policies and procedures and a current uh, risk analysis and an assigned uh, HIPAA security officer and so forth, then you need to really build the program and make sure that it's built uh, using the new regulations. If you do have a good program, then you need to modify your policies and procedures to include the new changes. Uh, you may have to change your workflows and train your workforce and then document your ongoing compliance, but you've got the new rules and the specific ones we talked about today were some of the changes to the data breach rules, but I think one of the biggest ones is the business associates, which we're going to talk about uh, as a separate step. If you are a business associate, You've got to start from scratch the same way that healthcare organizations did back in 2003 and 2005 when the uh, privacy and security rules kicked in. So you need to create policies and procedures. When I say you need to modify your workflows for compliance, we deal with IT companies a lot. And one of the questions that comes up is, give me an example of a workflow. Well, it would be easy in the sense that if you have a healthcare client who needs to dispose of a computer. There's protected health information on the hard drive. So in the past, I think a lot of IT companies would have transferred the data maybe to the new computer, brought back the old computer, and then um, hopefully they destroyed the hard drive and made it unusable. But some of the changes, as we've talked to these companies that have been doing these things and asked questions, the first thing I recommended to one of them was, why would you move the hard drive with the data back to your office and then erase it? You could erase it on site. And that reduces the risk of loss or theft. Then bring it back to the office, destroy the hard drive, document that you did that. In fact, you may even want to photograph the drive and add it to your service ticket that it was destroyed and keep a record for that so that if there's a question, say, six months later, and an investigator is asking what happened, if you've done these things correctly and documented them, you may be able to prove that a breach didn't occur. The frustrating thing would be, even if you did all the right things but you don't have it properly documented, you may not have the evidence that you did it, which is why we talk about training your workforce and documenting your ongoing compliance. Even if you did the right thing, you need to document it, and this goes for all HIPAA-covered entities as well, that documentation, particularly with the IT departments and the people that are, are moving large blocks of data or protecting large blocks of data, you need to document your work. And many IT people, frankly, don't like to do a lot of documentation, but in this case, it's very important. So paperwork. Uh, 
and we're talking about the documentation that's required as part of a compliance program. So for covered entities, you're going to need to create a new notice of privacy practices, distribute it to new patients, and make it easily available for your current patients. Again, you don't have to send them out to all your current patients. You need new business associate agreements. You're going to have new business associates, and maybe these are organizations that you've done business with in the past and that you did not send an agreement to, so you need to do that. The other thing is, is that as your business associates are working with you and finding out that they've got subcontractors working with them, you may want to work with them to make sure that the business associate agreement that's moving down the line represents your requirements. Business associate agreements don't have to be changed right now. You don't have to send out new business associate agreements to everyone, but the, all the contracts that you have must be reflective of the new requirements by March of 2014. And keep in mind that even though the agreement may not exist, you literally may not have a contract in place, go back to that concept. The act is what's governed even if there's not a contract in place. The new rules even apply with old or no agreements. So if you have an organization providing you with certain services and they're using an old, you have an old agreement with them or maybe you never signed an agreement with them, they're still a business associate and they're still liable for compliance even though you may not have done the paperwork. Business associates have to make sure that you've got agreements with your subcontractors. So if you're using an online backup service or storing equipment or sharing services, uh, servers in a data center, you need to have agreements now with your subcontractors to make sure that the data is protected. And again, I know that there are a lot of companies that are frustrated by this, but I think we're all patients. And when we think about having our records stored or protected by a healthcare organization, that we want to make sure that everyone they work with and everyone down the line that the business associates work with also comply simply to make sure that our records are protected. Step three, and maybe it was step one, is identify business associates. So for covered entities, you need to review all of your vendors and advisor lists. I use the term advisor to represent organizations like lawyers and accountants to determine which access patient data. And they don't have to be in front of a computer accessing patient data the same way that people in your workforce would. It's just that in the course of their work, do they have access to patient data? And there's been some guidance out there, for instance, that an electronic medical records company is not a business associate because it sold you an EMR system. However, when they provide you with service and they have to access your data files, then they become a business associate because they're looking at your patient records. That's an actual example that's out on the Health and Human Services website. So IT companies, because IT companies, and these were people that would support a business either to support an internal IT staff or in lieu of an internal IT staff, access data all the time. And they may have a help desk service where they're working with people or they may come in and upgrade a hard drive and move data from one drive to the other. They're business associates. Shredding companies literally physically touch the data. So when the shredding truck comes in, the person comes into the office, unlocks, locks, uh, wastebasket, takes the paper records, which are protected health information, and puts them in the shredder. They're touching patient information. There are some hidden things, like in your copiers, many of them have hard drives that support the scanning functions and some of the things. Those are protected. That may be protected data. Collections companies, revenue cycle management companies, transcriptionists, if they're not on your staff and you're sending them the data, they're a business associate. Regulatory agencies, lawyers, so if, a, if you're a healthcare organization and, and you're defending yourself in a lawsuit or if you're suing someone and you have to provide patient data as evidence, you've now shared patient data with your lawyer, they become a business associate, and in in an accounting firm that comes in and does an audit, which may take a patient record 
and track it all the way through the financial system, they're also business associates because they're looking at patient data. You have to work with your BAs to determine which of their subcontractors handle your data. That's huge. And for business associates, I'll say it again, you have to identify your subcontractors that handle data and remember, even if they don't access it. Let's go back to why all these things are in place. All of these requirements are to reduce the, 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 or the possibility of a data breach and reduce the impact of a data breach. So one of the first things that you have to do for HIPAA is a risk analysis. You have to identify all the locations of protected health information and all the processes used to transport it. You really need to have somebody with technical ability go through and help you search your network and document all the different processes used to transport data. Once you find the data, the easiest way to reduce the risk is reduce the locations. So for instance, if you have patient data sitting out on a bunch of desktop computers in an office, you can control that and secure it better if the data is moved to central file servers and then those computers are linked to the file servers. You want to reduce the access to minimal necessary, the HIPAA requirement. Don't transport protected health information by email, text message, voice messages, anything that goes out of your organization because these are not secure systems. And text messaging has been proven not to be secure. Uh, we all know this from the scandals over in England with uh, the newspapers and things that were hacking into people's text messages. Even when you delete a text message and you think it's gone because it's no longer on your phone, it still resides in that system and that's a data breach. Erase data from drives before disposal. Encrypt protected health information on computers and portable storage. If data is lost and it's encrypted, it's not reportable. And then the last thing is reporting. Require your workforce and your business associates to report breaches immediately because once you know about the breach, it's easy to deal with and you need to make that a policy and a requirement. Last is monitoring and maintenance. You can't be compliant today and be sure you're going to be compliant tomorrow or next week or next month. So you need to have systems in place to ensure the protection stay active. Those can be uh, internal audits by your own people to monitor different things, or these could be technical systems that monitor devices and equipment. You want to monitor your employee activities to prevent and detect breaches. You want to make sure that your business associates and subcontractors comply, and you may want external auditing from an independent opinion just to be sure that if an auditor came in from the government to uh, audit you or to uh, investigate you after a breach, that hiring a consultant to come in and do an independent audit may pick up some things that you can correct before problems occur. And then maintenance. The IT equipment that's set up today for many, many different reasons may not be compliant tomorrow. So you want to either have a full-time staff or a managed service provider. You, want to, you have to have ongoing awareness and training for your staff. Again, staff can be a weak link in terms of security, but you need to train them, train new people as they're coming in and make sure other, uh, your existing workforce stays aware. An annual security risk analysis is required unless there are significant changes when it needs to be more often. And you also need to stay current with any changes and enforcements uh, when it comes to the regulation. So those are the five steps that if you follow these, uh, you should be able to maintain compliance with a new final rule for the HIPAA omnibus package. Mike, we have a large audience today and numerous questions, but we're running out of time. Uh, because we have limited time, we're going to assemble all of the audience questions and create an uh, FAQ document linked through your column later this week. So for those of you who had questions and for everyone else, uh, to find answers to the questions, please visit Mike's HIT security column under the content tab at emrapproved.com later on this week. Answers to prior HIPAA events and helpful security links may also be found at emrapproved.com under the content tab
within EMR HIT resources in the HIPAA and security link. Visit formedtraining.com for information about easy online HIPAA certification training, which includes legal business associate agreement templates and other helpful resources for your workforce training and awareness program needs. Thank you, Mike, for that detailed and informative session, and thank you, for, thank you everyone for attending today. All registered attendees will receive an email later today with links to recorded and print versions of this session. And be sure to look for answers to your questions on Mike's column, HIT Security at EMRapproved.com. Thank you.